On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're going to dive into the NBA Finals with a preview from Robert Horry of Locked On NBA Today and a mock draft roundup. What's the NBA landscape thinking will happen with picks 2, 12, 30, and 34 for OKC? Plus, update you on some big changes to my NBA draft big board. All that and more coming up on today's Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. Are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, media member, and editor in chief over at thunderousintentions.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by Rock Auto. We're going to dive into the NBA Finals with a special preview from Robert Horry of Locked On NBA Today. Our mock draft roundups and an update on my NBA draft big board all coming up. But thank you for making Lockdown Thunder your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Make sure you check out yesterday's interview with Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft on Twitter, talking all about the NBA draft. Coming up later today, we're going to have another podcast, a bonus episode talking about Jeremy Sohan, uh, his player profile and projection. Friday is going to be Ben Matherin's player profile and projection. And then Monday, we're going to be joined by a very special guest. You will not want to miss it. Uh, coming up on Monday. So subscribe anywhere you get podcasts from, including on YouTube. But today's show is brought to you by Rock Auto. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Tell them Lockdown sent you in the how did you hear about us box, and they'll know what to do from there. Let's talk about my NBA draft big board. Uh, I made a whole podcast about it a few weeks ago, but things have obviously changed since then. We've had the NBA Combine. We've gotten to talk to agents, scouts, whomever about NBA draft workouts and how players are doing and how things are fluctuating. So I want to give you an updated big board and then review what the biggest changes were. So my number one remains Jabari Smith Jr. Number two remains Shed Holmgren. Number three, Paul Bencaro. Number four, Jay Nivey moves up from five to four. I flip-flop him and Shaden Sharp. Uh, I, I just, I think that with Jay Nivey, he's going to be a better player or at least a quote unquote, safer player. And most of the time, whenever you take the safer player, you're sacrificing ceiling, right? In the case of Akai Baji versus uh, Usman Jiang, you're sacrificing the ceiling of Jiang for the safeness of Akbaji, who, while I don't see any bust potential in Akbaji, I do see a low, low, low ceiling. The more you look into it, you're not sacrificing much ceiling with picking Jaden Ivey, but you're giving yourself a much better path to reach his ceiling than the path it would take to reach sharp ceiling. So it's only one spot difference. I still love sharp, but I have him back now down to the consensus five uh, on my big board. Uh, Ben McMatherin is now my number six. Keegan Murray is now my number seven. And AJ Griffin slips a bit to number eight. I have Dyson Daniels fly up to number nine. Johnny Davis fly up to number 10. Jalen Duren dropped down to 11. Jeremy Sohan at 12. Akai Baji leaps up one spot over Usman Jiang at 14. So that's my top 14. And then I have Jaden Hardy at 15. He's a now a top 15 prospect with Mark Williams at 16. And then Malachi Branham at 17. And then I have Nikola Jovic at 18, Terry Eason at 19, and Jalen Williams from Santa Clara at 20. So my top 20, again, is Jabari Smith Jr., Chet Holmgren, Paul Bencaro, Jaden Ivey, Shaden Sharp, Ben Matherin, Keegan Murray, AJ Griffin, Dyson Daniels, Johnny Davis, Jalen Duran, Jeremy Sohan, Okag Baji, Usman Diang, and Jaden Hardy with Mark Williams, Malachi Branham, uh, Nikola Jovic, Terry Eason, and Jalen Williams from Santa Clara, rounding out the top 20. Um, this draft to me, I think that those 20 guys are your first round grades. Technically, for me, my first round grade stops at Malachi Branham. I have 17 first round grades in this class, but I could see a ceiling of Jovic being worth a first round grade. I could see Eason being worth it. I've heard some bad things about Eason's pre-draft workouts. I've heard some things that are not great coming out 
of his pre-draft workouts, but I still have him in my top 20. I still think that he's a really good player there. Jalen Williams is flying up everybody's board after the combine. I think he's going to be a really good player. I think that you can get to 20 first round grades, but to me, it's hard to see it past 20. I stop it at 17. Uh, I try to be as, as hard as I can on the first round grades. Of course, there has to be 30 first round picks, but who is actually a first round talent? I stop at 17. I would go to 20 uh, with no problem. And then I have Blake Wesley just missing the cut at 21. Uh, Kendall Brown at 22. I still have Candy Chandler at 23 for me. I really like Candy Chandler's game despite his size. I think that the size is the only knock on him. While a big knock, we've seen other players maneuver around being a small guard. Uh, Ty Ty Washington at 24. I think you can flip-flop Candy Chandler and Ty Ty Washington any any day of the week here. Uh, Again, the biggest knock on Candy Chandler is his size. So if the size deters you, I totally understand having Ty Ty Washington higher than Candy Chandler. And with the data that we have about underutilized guards from Kentucky kind of flourishing in the NBA that even adds more to Ty Ty Washington than just what we've seen in college. And what we saw in college was a plus playmaker who has a ton of three point upside, uh, more defensive limitations, I think than Chandler, despite his height, uh, because he just lacks that, you know, he lacks that burst and he lacks that kind of lateral quickness, but still I like Ty Ty Washington 25. I have Wendell Moore jr. 26. I have Christian Braun 27. I have Merjan Beauchamp, who I think is almost a carbon copy of Darius Baisley, but we'll get into that during his profile. Number 28, I have Leonard Miller. Uh, he has offers from Kentucky, ba- uh, Bama, uh, Arizona State. We'll have to see at the official, official deadline if he pulls out or stays in the in the, uh, in the co- in the the uh, college ranks. It seems as though he's skipping college to play professionally in some capacity, but again, the NBA's date is different than the NCAA's date, and if he is playing professionally, uh, that does not necessarily mean uh, it'll be the NBA draft. It could be the NBA G League. So that, that he has until two more days from now to make that decision. Remember, yesterday's deadline, where you saw Drew Timmy go back and other players go back, that was based solely on NCAA. Since Leonard Miller is open to going the G League route for Team McKnight, then you know he still has time to make his decision. But I do like the potential of Leonard Miller uh, as a another high school swing that has a lot of potential and has a lot of ceiling to grow with. If he drops out, obviously these guys move up. I have Bryce McGowan's at 29, and then Keon Ellis leaps into the top 30. The Thunder have worked out Keon Ellis and Bryce McGowan's. Uh, I think that Keon Ellis's pre-draft workouts have gone incredible. I think that they could not have gone any better from what I'm hearing. So I really like what Keon, Keon Ellis is doing in the top 30, you know, moving up to the top 30 and in the pre-draft process. So I'm at 30. Uh, Hugo Basson drops off of my top 30 list. Christian Coloco at 32. Uh, EJ Liddell at 33. And then the biggest faller here is Patrick Baldwin Jr. He drops to 34, uh, and then that, of course, pushes down Jalen Williams from Arkansas and Jordan Hall from St. Joe's down to 36. Uh, The only other risers I could see, I really like Gene Montero. I I really think that he could kind of elevate to a higher uh, second-round pick. Uh, Some other guys that I could see moving up in this draft is a guy like Peyton Watson, uh, because guys like Isaiah Wong have now returned to college and things like that. We can do a whole top 60. If you, if you would love that, I, I struggle with doing a whole top 60 in one podcast because I'm not sure the demand is there for it to be completely honest with you, especially as the thunder only have picks in the high thirties, you know, 34, 30, and then 12 and two. So uh, let me know in the comment section below or on Twitter, if you want to hear my whole 60 big board, uh, we can, we can totally get into that as well. But again, I don't want to unnecessarily drag this out. So the, again, the big changes, Ivy goes back to the top four, Murray and Matherin jump A.J. Griffin. Daniels and Johnny Davis jump Jalen Duran. Uh, Okagbaji is ahead of uh, Usman Jiang for now. Jaden Hardy at 15. Mark Williams at 16. I flip-flop those guys. And then Malachi Brand jumps from 30 to 17 since our last update. Terry Eason falls to 20. And I still like him in the top 20 despite the bad workout rumblings. Jalen Williams jumps uh, all the way up to 21 with a, with a first-round grade. Actually, he's at 20 with a first-round grade. Uh, Bray, uh, Bryce McCowan's jumps four slots in this one. Keon Ellis up three slots. And then uh, Blake Wesley goes from 30 to 22. And the biggest of all big moves, Patrick Baldwin Jr. goes from top 10 in November to 17 on our last big board to post combine and post workouts down to 34 on my big board. That, that, that pains me, but the injuries are a huge concern. I still really like Patrick Baldwin Jr. as an upside swing in the second round, but the injuries are just too big of a concern for me. Uh, so I've moved him down a bit. So again, in recap, for the first round grades, I think that you have 17 to 21 guys worth a first round pick. 
And of course, there's 30 selections, so 30 people are going to be a first-round pick. But pure talent-wise, uh, I think that you're going to see about 17 to 21 guys for the first-round grade. I will say next year, though, we all have our eyes on Victor Wimbanyana. Past Victor, right? I'd be shocked if next year's draft isn't 30 plus deep of first round grades. That's how good it looks right now. Granted, again, I just mentioned Patrick Baldwin Jr. this time last year was a top 10 pick. So things can change quickly, but that's just kind of where we're at right now with the next draft. The next draft is just loaded with talent. Now, but let me know how many first round picks that, that you have on your board. How many picks past Jalen Williams did you think deserve first round uh, love in, in terms of the grading aspect of things? Uh, let me know on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles or on YouTube in the comment section down below. You can, you can comment down below all of your thoughts, but I do want to tell you right now who is totally worth the first round grade. And that is rockauto.com. Rockauto.com is a family owned business serving you auto parts online for 20 years. That's right. 20 years ago, you could have been going to rockauto.com and finding all the parts that your car will ever need. It's simple. It's easy. And folks, I know nothing about cars, not a single thing about cars. But what I do know is that rockauto.com has me covered because they have no idea if I'm a do-it-yourselfer or if I am a mechanic or if I don't know a thing about cars. They don't know. So they're going to give me the same reliably low price they give everybody else. Check them out today, rockauto.com. Tell them that Lockdown sent you in the how did you hear about us box and they'll know what to do from there. It could not be any easier than going to rockauto.com. Rockauto.com, amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. We are back on the Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. We have a very important favor to ask you. We've put together a survey so we can learn more about the listeners like you and make your favorite Locked On Podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked On Podcast. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It will not take very long, and everyone that completes a survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. To, to take our audience survey, go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. That's to take the survey, to go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you for your help. So let's continue talking about the NBA draft. That is, of course, the most important topic around Oklahoma City right now uh, in terms of the basketball world. And we're going to dive into the Mock Draft Roundup. The Mock Draft Roundup will be a segment we do weekly now coming forward to, through the draft of just where these guys nationally have OKC picking and, and you know, in terms of the prospects and uh, how the prospects mesh together with the uh, Mock Draft. So Pretty simple. We're going to go through ESPN, Sports Illustrated, CBS, and so on and so on, and talk about where they have these prospects for OKC. So ESPN, they have Chet at two. Spoiler alert, everybody has Chet at two. Everybody has Chet at two. Spoiler alert there for, for you guys. Chet, Jiang, Blake Wesley, Kendall Brown. Sports Illustrated only did the lottery, Chet and Jiang. CBS has Chet, Jalen Duran, Kendall Brown. Bleacher Report has Chet, Jalen Duran, Blake Wesley, Christian Coloco. Don't love that second-round pick from Blake, from a Bleacher Report. Do not love that at all. NBC has Chet, Tari Eason, Gene Montero. Weird combination for the first round. Two guys, Eason, Montero, who are very interesting to me uh, in the first round, but I don't love the Eason pick at 12. NBA.com has Chet and Jeremy Sohan, which I love. The Ringer has Chet and uh, Usman Jiang. The Athletic has Chet, Dyson Daniels, and then the Yahoo Sports website has Chet and Akagbaji. Tankathon has Chet, Johnny Davis, and Jalen Williams. That's probably my favorite favorite mock draft right there is tankathon.com. If they walk away with Chet, Johnny Davis, and Jalen Williams, I'll be very excited uh, for OKC's uh, draft that night in the first round. So I, I want to use the mock draft roundup to talk about the draft as a whole. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to bore you with going through every single link of these mock drafts and talk about where every single pick went wrong. What I'm going to do is use this really cool tool that you can also look up. It's on NBA.com. It's the consensus mock draft. They take all the mock drafts, they compile them together, and then they average it out, of course, where each pick landed uh, for each team. And they just kind of make the pick there. So for example, Jabari Smith Jr. had seven people pick him to go to the Magic. So they assigned him to the Magic. So they kind of just use the most common picks for each slot. Most common pick for each slot for the Thunder, pick two, Chet. 
makes sense. Uh, it's either me, him or Jabari Smith Jr. at two. You love to see Chet fall. Chet's at two. That makes sense. The big discussion point comes at 12. At 12, you have Jeremy Sohan, and then here's the names around him. Dedek Matherin, Dyson Daniels, A.J. Griffin, they all tied for 11 in, uh, in, in the Knicks pick, right? So that, that's clear that there's enough of a consensus around these major media outlets that have a guy like, you know, A.J. Griffin, Dyson Daniels, Bank Matherin falling to the Knicks at, at 11. Uh, at, at eight, the Pelicans, they, they're another team that had a hodgepodge of, of uh, options. That, them and the Blazers both had the options of Duran, Griffin, Matherin. This just gives more kind of credence to somebody has to fall to 12, right? Somebody has to be the odd man out of this group because the Blazers can't pick three people. The Pelicans can't pick three people. The Knicks can't pick three people. Somebody has to order this out and fall uh, whenever it gets showtime in June. So a big name will be there at 12, I really believe. For the Thunder, they end up getting Jeremy Sohan, but pick behind them was Mark Williams and Malachi Branham. I love Malachi Branham for OKC specifically. Um, I know I have him at 17 right now, but a lot of these prospects' future solely depends on where they go, solely depends on the developmental structure and ecosystem that they're being thrusted into from coaches to developmental coaches to run offices and everything else. Right. And I just think that Malachi Branham is a perfect thunder player as to where even though he's something on my board, if the thunder picked them, I'd feel very good about it. And that's where things get interesting in the sense of uh, where he's going, because I've seen people elevate Malachi Branham to top 10. And I don't think that that's crazy. I've also seen him, you know, 12, 17, 20, so on and so forth. Uh, I think, He's my next big riser. Uh, I really do believe that uh, whenever we do this again, the week before the draft, Malachi Branham could easily leap Mark Williams, Jaden Hardy, uh, Usman Jiang, Akai Baji, and then maybe even leap Jeremy Sohan. Uh, you know, I, I think that he could leap Jeremy Sohan for me to 12. I don't see him going past 12. That'd be really rash to do uh, a week before the draft, but I think that he can get in that 12 range for me easily. In fact, I think that by like three days from now, he could be uh, 12 for me on my big board. So, the whenever I say that the you know edge is razor thin, and I say that on all these podcasts, I truly mean it. Even on my own personal big board, I can see the difference splitting hairs between all these different players. In fact, right now, as I'm talking, I'm I'm forcing myself not to just click on his name and move him up at least to 14. In fact, I just did it, so he's 14 now. But nonetheless, uh, you know that's how razor thin the edges. I love Malachi Branham to OKC if it were to happen, and so he's kind of right there in that range to where the point being is. For the Thunder, they're going to have a ton of options at 12 if they don't want to move up and they don't want to get additional assets. They're not forced to, to do anything. And that's the beautiful part about this offseason. This entire offseason, they're not forced to do anything. They're not forced to trade out Horford. It's $10 million. It's expiring. They can either use it at the deadline for an expiring deal, which teams love, as you know, in the NBA. They can buy it out and not have to spread it more than this year, just eat the $10 million and have an open roster spot. Or they can just let him sit on the bench and play him 50% of the games or 30% of the games or however the split ends up being, but play them. I mean, th th there's so many options. They're not forced into any, any move this offseason. And I think, I think that that is such a leverage play. Whenever you have such a great GM and Sam Presti, when you give Sam Presti the leverage of not being, not being hamstrung by something, not, not having a clear indication of what he has to do. The sky is the limit for the possibilities that can happen off of that for Sam Presti. So I love this offseason for the thunder. Uh, we'll see how much smoke there is, how much, Truth there is to the smoke around Jay Nivey and, and these other players. What I think is happening right now is the best smoke screen of all time because Jay Nivey's agent has everyone believing that they're going to take them. I mean, there's now smoke screen around the Jay Nivey Rockets pick, uh, Pistons pick, Kings pick, Thunder pick, right? There's that side of it. I also think that, hey, the Thunder might like Jay Nivey, right? And they might be putting out there, hey, you know, we like Jay Nivey. If you're asking us our opinion on Jay Nivey, we like him. If you're asking us where we're going to pick it two, it's a different conversation, right? But you asked us about if we liked Ivy or not. And we like Ivy. Like it, it can be a ton of different things. We don't get the full context of these conversations when they're reported. But I think that it was bestly put uh, by Jake Fisher of Bleacher Report. He put in there, look, there's a lot of smoke around Jay Nivey. Uh, that's all fine and well. But at two, the most likely thing that they're going to do from everything that he's heard is Chet Holmgren. That's not a direct quote, but that's kind of what the quote ended up meaning uh, You know that, that he put out there. I, I will link his direct quote. Uh, on Twitter and everything. You can find it over there at Ryland underscore styles on Twitter. Uh, of course, subscribe, subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast from free and available on YouTube, all podcatchers, everything out there. 
Uh, we're going to leave you with a finals preview. Al Horford is in the finals. Thunder legend Al Horford is in the finals. We're going to preview it with Robert Horry, who is, of course, a 16-year NBA veteran, a seven-time NBA champion, a 11th overall pick in the 1992 NBA draft. He joined Peter Bukowski of Locked On Sports today to talk all about the finals matchup. So make sure you give it a listen. We're going to attach that to the end of this podcast. But first, let's say right now, but our good friends over at Bet Online. And speaking of the finals, you can bet on the finals at betonline.net, your number one source for all betting needs, sports info, final latest developments, and news and odds, including this year's baseball uh, playoffs and baseball season, basketball championship matchup between the Celtics and the Warriors. In NHL hockey in the conference finals right now, MMA, UFC, you name it, they have it. Bet online. Go check them out today at their website. It's this easy, folks. You type in bet online, you type in on your URL bar, bet online, you go to their sports book, right? Go down to basketball, NBA, NBA basketball games, Celtics, Warriors, Celtics, three and a half point underdogs. Let's take the Celtics here in this one at bet online. So go check them out today, bet online, and place your bets on sports. And now, it's time for Robert Ory. The Golden State Warriors are minus 150, the favorites in the NBA Finals against the Boston Celtics. Joining me now, Robert Ory, seven-time NBA champion, is here courtesy of Bet Online. Check out Bet Online for all the up-to-date lines on the NBA Finals. Finals MVP, finals props, and each and every game line. This is great to have you here. Why do you think, because the line has moved a little bit in, in the Celtics' favor, why do you think there are people that like the Celtics' matchup against the Warriors? Because the smart people know defense wins championships. Mm. And if you look at the Celtics' team, they got two players on that team that made the all-defensive team. You know, smart, of course, defensive player of the year. But Robert Williams is one of those guys that is an eraser. He can block shots. He can, you know, you know, he can erase a lot of mistakes that you make on the perimeter. And you think about it, you got Brown, Tatum, and Smart, who can get up on people defensively and funnel them to that guy. Next thing you know, it's getting blocked. And if you look at the way, you know, Harford has been playing, he's turned back the hands of time. He's blocking <laughs> shots again. So if you, overall, I think that the, that, that the Celtics is a better defensive team than the Warriors because even though you have Draymond Green, Green Clay Thompson is not the Clay Thompson of old who can do the things he used to be able to do. And, and, and so I just think that's, that's a big key for them, for the Celtics, that is. How do you see Defensive Player of the Year Marcus Smart matching up with, with Steph Curry? Is that going to be something where you see that Marcus is going to pick him up 94 feet? Like, how do you think – smart is going to approach that assignment if he does get that assignment, which we assume he's going to. But you know what? I don't think it's going to be a one-man job. If you look at the Celtics, they one, two, three are all athletic guys. And you go to the two, Jalen, and go to the Tatum, they get taller. You know, it's like, yeah. like the bars on a cell phone. And I think even, even though they like to do a lot of switching, I think they're, they're, they're perfect for this matchup. It's a perfect matchup for, for the Celtics and when they got the guard. And because, you know, Clay is going to be constantly moving. And so, so, you know, not the same as a Jimmy Butler or Tyler Hero, but I think this, what they just did against the Heat, is like a, a, a prelude to a preclude to what they're going to do. And so I think they're going to be fine defensively switching and getting ready for Steph. It sounds like you like the Celtics in this one. You know, a lot of my Laker fans are going to be mad at me because they said you cannot <laughs> wear anything green. You can never root for the Celtics. <laughs> I'm not rooting for the Celtics. You know, I, I would like to see my former teammate, Emil Duco win his first championship, you know, so I would like for that to happen. But, you know, I just think being the basketball mindset, I just think that there, there's a good chance the Celtics to win this thing. All right. So we have some odds here. Celtics in six is plus 375. Celtics in seven is plus 650. If people are going to bet on it, what is, what is your prediction? If you like Boston, six, seven? Hey, you know what? If you, you try to make some money, right? <laughs> that's why you that's why you gamble. And so I will go with the Celtics in seven because I think the Celtics have been a battle-tested team on the road. They've won a lot of games on the road. They just won the Eastern Conference on the road. And so I think they're ready. I'm not saying everybody will say, well, the, you know, the Heat is a different monster than, you know, the Warriors and blah, blah, blah. But I still think it all 
boils down to having confidence and playing well on the road and, and believing that you can win on the road. There has also been this discussion now, especially among Celtics fans, about what this Celtics team has had to face, what particularly who had Jason Tatum has had to face. Kevin Durant in the first round, Giannis and Tedekumbo in the second round, Jimmy Butler on a heater, no pun intended for Miami. And now Steph Curry, you're talking about at least three Pantheon guys, guys who are all time great players. Who do you think has the most on the line legacy wise in this series for whom would that one title you won seven, who would that one title mean the most for? You know, I'm, I'm going to go off script a little bit and, and I, I'm going to stop people from thinking this is going to be the greatest run ever by the Celtics. That's not true because you got Hornacek, set Carmelo. You got Kevin Johnson, Charles Barkley. You got Dennis Rodman, uh, MVP, David Robinson. Then you got Shaquille and Penny. Now that is the greatest run in, back in 95. So when people say this might be the greatest run, stop it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because all these teams was 50, you know, 55, 50 plus win teams. And so I just think if you, if you look at this game and you have to pick an MVP you know, of course, it's, it's going to be it Tatum, but this run that the Celtics are on is incredible. You know, don't get me wrong because they've been able to win on the road, which is key because you have to run on the road in order to win championship. That's if unless you have home court advantage and you protect your home court. But I just think overall, when you look at the makeup of these two teams, they're similar. You know, go to State Wars, they were the Celtics six, seven years ago when they first entered the playoffs. And nobody thought they could win a championship. Next thing you know, they win a championship. In the following season, they win all these games and don't win a championship. And then they get KD and they win two more. But I think if you look at the Celtics, there are so there are so many similarities with these teams that people are always going to say, oh, let's go with the veteran leadership. Let's go with the fan favorite and Steph. You know, let's think, let's think about it. Because everybody wants Steph to win because we know he got robbed one time with the MVP in the finals. And then he, take, he took a step back and let KD come in to his team, which is Steph team, and take two MVPs. And so I, 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 I do think Steph has a lot to prove and his legacy is on the line when it comes to this because, you know, all the chatter now is about him not having a, a MVP in the finals, which we all know he was robbed of one. So let's, let's be real about that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at these MVP odds as you're talking about the MVP and, and we expect Curry and Tatum right at the top in terms of the odds. You're not getting really good value there. I'm looking at Jalen Brown, 10 to one. Yeah. I'm looking at Draymond 22 to one. Like if he really turned it up defensively, people forget in that game seven against the Cavs, he had a triple double in that game. He was the best warrior on the floor in that game. I'm looking at Marcus smart at 40 to one. It seems like you're, you can get some good value and we've seen, including in this Warriors run, that it's not always the stars who win these finals MVPs. It's true. You know, for me, if if I wanted to take the odds, I'm, I'm going to eliminate the top three automatically. And I don't I don't think Clay is, you know, you know, Clay is a game five, game six type of player. But me, I would go with Andrew Wiggins. If I had to mm. pick someone with the odds, I would go with Andrew Wiggins, who is 20 to one. And think about it. He has started to come into his own. Yeah. He, after that dunk on, on Luca, <laughs> all of a sudden this dude is smiling big. He's he's enthusiastic. He's playing hard, and he's an all star. You know, I think some people forget he was an all star. I think this is a good way in the biggest stage to show everybody that the all star uh, committee didn't make a mistake. So if I had to take all because I don't think Draymond Green he don't shoot he doesn't shoot enough, and he's gonna have to guard too many people, so he's gonna be all over the board that. So if you look down that list of people and you want to say oh, odds maker, for me, I would take Andrew Wiggins 20 to one. That is, I, I mean, that, that's bold. I love it. Uh, I think you're right that that he he seems to be a different player. Just in the Warriors, just in Golden State, he seems to have been unlocked a little bit, whether that's Steve Kerr, whether that's just him feeling more comfortable. We're talking about legacy. And you have been on some teams that have gone on these multi-year runs that have been what we, we might consider dynastic, right? There have been some discussions here. If the Warriors win one, that because it's the Clay, Steph, Draymond core with Steve Kerr, that this has to be considered part of the Warriors run and that we have to call them a dynastic team. Where do you fall on that discussion? If they win one, are they a dynasty? You know what? It's, it's, I will put them in that category as a dynasty. <clears throat> you know, if you, if you, because they was riddled with injuries, Right. Two years. Clay was out and Steph went out. 
you know, you, you say, okay, we'll give them, we'll give them a Phil Jackson asterisk by those two years. But if they were to get back to the mountaintop and win this year, I, I would put them, you know, you got one more step to be a dynasty. And then if they go to the finals again, then I would give them a dynasty. But, you know, think about this. They gave us a dynasty in the Lakers. We won three in a row. And next thing you know, they dismount a team. They go back and lose. It's considered a dynasty. So, you know, if you, to me, there's only been, you know, three dynasties in this Bulls, the Celtics, and the Lakers because they're in a situation where they went six plus championships. You know, I, I, that's what you look at. But in this day, in this era, you can give them a dynasty. I think, I think you, I, I, I would, I would consider the Spurs, the Tim Duncan, Greg Popovich Spurs in that mix, but they never won back to back titles. And so it depends on how you want to qualify it. Sustained yeah. success, not always enough. I, I think if you're a Boston fan, you're going, why can't we have that sustained run? We've got these two young superstars, Marcus Smart, defensive player of the year, who's coming into his own a little bit defensively. It seems like they've unlocked some things with him as their pure point guard in initiating offense because he doesn't have to create for everyone. They've got Tatum and Brown who can create for themselves. I mean, this, what, what do you think the chances are that they could be not the next dynasty, but the next team that you have to deal with in the Eastern Conference? Like, okay, they're going to be there every year until further notice. You know, I, I think you look down that line and you says, OK, Tatum, first team, Max, Brown, Max, Smart, Max. These are super Max contracts these guys yeah, potentially can get. Right. So now we're, you know, if you since I cover the Lakers, the Lakers got 40 million dollars, guys, three, 40 million guys. They can't get nobody else on the team unless they do some hell of a drafting, you know, and, and they get those guys that's going to be there. But it boils down to payday, man. If you're going to stick around and get paid or you're going to have that one falter and say, oh, you know, we didn't win a championship. We need to make a move because, you know, they exported us in this area. We need to get someone in. And they trade one of those guys. You know, people do dumb things like that. Well, GMs, I should say. So I think they have the potential to make a long run. This is going to have to stick together and do what a Tim Duncan would do and say, you know, what, I'm going to take less money. So you can sign a Tony Parker, you sign a Manu Ginobili. But are these guys now, you know, Selfless enough with it and say, hey, you know what? I don't want to make 40 million. I make 30 million. You know, I, I don't think so. I think every now every guy now is trying to get their bag so they can say, you know what? At one point in my career, I was making 50, 40 million, whatever it may be. So I don't, that's gonna be the key though. It boils down to money if they can keep that team together. All right, not a finals question, but I can't talk to big shot Bob and not ask you this question. Which of your big shots is your favorite? You know, um, I grew up a Lakers fan, a huge Magic Johnson fan. And one of my biggest thrills before I even made it to the NBA, I got to play one-on-one -on -one with Magic when I was being scouted by the Lakers coming out of college, coming out of University of Alabama. So the shot I made against the Sacramento Kings in 2001 to win that game is probably my favorite. And I, don't get me wrong, I love what I did in Houston. I love what I did in San Antonio. But – Everything I did in, in San Antonio was on the road, game five on the road. But this was at home in Staples Center. And the ego comes into play where you want to hear that crowd chant your name, man. And you run off the court and the crowd still chanting your name. You're in the locker room. You can still hear them chanting your name. So I think that shot, it, 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 it takes over all the other shots just for the ego. You know, we are all as athletes got some type of ego. And I think for me, that just takes over because I had the Laker fans chanting my name. They weren't chanting Shaq. They weren't chanting Kobe. They were chanting Ori. So that's a big plus for me.